All right. Get on the, okay, there we go. Um, before we get started here, I'm gonna take a quick poll of the audience. Uh, who here works for an organization of uh, 20 or fewer engineers? Okay, what about people on about a 200 engineer organization? All right, 2,000? Okay, what about 20,000? And if you're in Google, you should raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Um, so, hi, I'm Richard Flyam. I lead the uh, Comcast Viper Engineering Efficiency Team. And uh, for those of us who are lucky enough to be among the founders of a really successful organization, um, we all face a problem. Scaling software is hard, and Kubernetes helps us scale software. Scaling organizations is actually harder, and Kubernetes can help you scale your organization as you grow, too. Uh, so seven years ago, I joined a three-engineer research team within Comcast for IP video. Um, it has doubled in size every year since. That organization called Viper is hundreds of engineers today. We have doubled the number of microservices we support every year. We serve tens of millions of customers. We sell our products to other providers. We deploy tens of thousands of instances into more than 50 data centers. Um, and if you can't read that architecture, don't worry, you're not supposed to. Um, like all good documentation, it's out of date anyways. Um, and I'm not here today to tell you, though, about all the wonderful things we do, because that wouldn't be very educational or entertaining. Instead, I'm here to tell you all the wonderful ways you can screw up growing your organizations. Because growing organizations, as I said, is hard, really hard. And hopefully I can share some insights on how to fix them. I'm gonna start a little bit with our story. All numbers are approximate. So when Viper released its first real customer application, we followed a fairly familiar pattern. We installed hardware in a data center, set up a sophisticated virtualization platform, created some VMs on it, and started up copies of microservices. That takes about five engineers, no big deal. So customer demand spikes for our product. We rapidly set up more machines and more sites. Anyone who has done operations on hundreds of physical and thousands of virtual instances probably knows one thing. Something is broken all the time at every hour of the night and day. So what do you do when you're a traditional technology organization? You hire an ops team. Comcast has been operating technology for 53 years now. We know how to hire ops teams. You train them, and you're off to the races. So now you're at about 15 engineers. Let's take it to another year later for us. Customer demand spiked again. Our ever-industrious dev team has added two new products and another development team. Now we need thousands of instances running in tens of data centers. Deployment has become a huge problem. We have too many manual configurations. Many deployments have missed their targets and left things in broken and hard to debug ways. Configuration drift is a huge issue. So time to set up Puppet, hire a few people to manage it, and run that. And that's what we did. So this is about a 50 engineer organization at Viper. Let's take it another year, and you're seeing the effects of doubling. Um, the business has asked for a huge feature set, so um, a very aggressive roadmap, and a sophisticated and entirely new product line called Cloud DVR. Um, we now serve millions of users every day. Our products include dynamic advertising, uh, an analytics pipeline, client-side players, and a home gateway. Um, at this deployment, at this point, deployments have gotten risky. Even with an eye towards simplicity, we have a very big set of products that are interconnected, and many things in the stack rely on each other. Subtle changes in the scaling of our operate, um, scaling or operations of our APIs mean outages only the developers themselves can troubleshoot, which is hugely problematic. Um, so in short, we have a quality problem particularly a multi-component integration quality problem. So what do you do when you're a traditional technology organization? 
uh, you hire a dedicated QA team for end-to-end -end integration. Oh, and you need to train them all and on what they'll be working on. So we're now at about 100 engineers, including our, our QA folks. One year later, um, we're now so successful, people in the industry are buying and deploying our components instead of others. Uh, we need an operations team just to handle our SaaS customers, not just our own internal infrastructure. We now run tens of thousands of virtual instances in more than 50 data centers. Our internal and external customers are demanding new features and pushing hard on our ability to even scale our software. The sales team is delaying onboarding new customers because we simply can't keep up with the pace necessary for deployment. All products now have large engineering, QA, and operations teams. New hires must receive information about all technologies and products. Um, and that information about new technologies and products, that needs to be disseminated to everybody in the organization for us to work effectively. So we're now at about 200 engineers. So we're seeing a problem here. It's hard to make 200 people as effective per person as 20 when they're all working on the same technology stack. Um, so why is that? Well, innately, three big things matter. Uh, first, communication is N by N. Second, organizational units will become bottlenecks. And third, um, organizations become coupled. So I'm going to have some fun with math here. Um, I'm going to write a recurrence relation for organizational communication, assuming a complete graph. Uh, that's one in which all nodes are connected by an edge. For those of us who haven't done this in a decade, we're going to try to figure out the flat form of a recursive equation. We'll call this update function u, and its input n will be the number of people in the organization. For my organization to stay in sync on changes with n people, I need two communications with everyone except for myself. This adds the term you see on the right there, or yeah, <laughs> uh, 2n minus 1. One communication of the change and one back, confirming the impact or the lack thereof. So every other team, when going through this change, needs to do the same thing. And this adds the recurrence term, u of n minus 1. So we obtain the recursive relation for our organization update function, u of n equals u of n minus 1 plus 2n minus 1. And if you, uh, if you remember the master method and you apply it here, you get n squared. So changing anything in our org and validating its impact is big O of n squared. And that's big O because that's for a complete graph. If we, have a, if we have a less connected graph, we can do better than that. So why is that important? Because rapidly, our ability to change and innovate becomes tied to our ability to communicate and train members of our, our organization. Uh, new features deep in the stack must be communicated and tested with other changes, and operations and QA trained on its use. So the more connected the graph, the more difficult it becomes to change. The more people you must work with and inform, the higher the bandwidth of that communication traffic. And this is a non-linear relationship, right? It's n squared. Even if we do that successfully, the volume of that information is going to exceed the ability of the individuals in the organization to process it, which encourages us to bank high-level release notes to batch changes. And that significantly increases our risk, which decreases our ability to deploy, which decreases our ability to, be chained, to make change, to be effective. So now worse, our velocity is now so awesome, it's breaking QA. They can't test component integrations when we are committing three times a day per product with major features. Release cycles are going to run long, and Ops is going to have trouble deploying new versions. Oh, and the poor infrastructure teams that support this. Everyone needs VMs and hardware from them all of the time. But those VMs 
when they're idle, um, are a pain to manage and chew up huge chunks of resources, and they must be continually managed by those teams. Even the lab team in this situation has trouble keeping up with developer demand. This is because our organizations all rely on someone. Just as your software becomes coupled, so do our organizational units. The more complete that connection graph, the harder it is to do anything. An organization's ability to make a change is limited by the ability of others to change. This decreases the ability of any unit to take effective action. It's also worth noting that at no point were any of these choices poor when we made them. Look, if you're running a single monolithic application on a few tens of boxes, Puppet and a small ops team makes tons of sense. If you're integrating five or six components, just hiring QA for end-to-end -end validation makes perfect sense. Insertion sort is faster on really small data sets. Um, the XKCD timetable uh, on automation explains this pretty well. Until you have a lot of people, automating small tasks doesn't make sense. Now, I could probably pick out a few of DevOps evangelists out there that are jumping about, about to jump out of their seats and say, developers should operate your software. Then you shouldn't have to train operations and fight deployments. But when you include local variants, there are tens of thousands of channels being broadcast to literally millions of users all day, every day in the Comcast footprint. We do cloud DVR recordings in the tens of petabytes per day. Heck, we have a team that's solely responsible for replacing failed hard drives, and that's not a joke. Um, here's the thing. If you want your developers to operate what they build, they have to be even capable of it. Puppet modules and VMs doesn't make an operable infrastructure. That's why, like running thousands of machines with your only capability being to edit init.d scripts. Don't get me wrong, Puppet's a great product, but it's not sufficient for that kind of scale. It takes a five-man team within an organization to make a component that millions of people, tens of millions of people use. They can't operate it without the right tools. And this is why I'm talking here today. You see, the thing is, when your organization really needs to scale itself, the overhead of people communication, of project management, of training, of integration, of anything, really escapes the ability of any human process to manage. All of these problems I just described are not just about scaling our software. They're about scaling ourselves, scaling the output of our work. And scaling ourselves isn't about the amount of work we do. If we double the amount of work we do, that's not that big of a deal. We need to scale the effectiveness of the work we do. And simply being able to make big changes also isn't enough. You need to be free to do so. We need to remove the limiters on our ability to act and increase the effect of those actions, which is why MYM communications, bottlenecks, and organizational coupling are so bad. They all limit our ability as engineers to act. So Kube can help us here. The Kube website refers to itself as a container orchestrator. I think of it as a distributed operating system. It helps abstract us from the hardware, right? It provides sophisticated multi-user permissions, especially with 1.6. Um, so let's talk about solving that huge operational overhead. The biggest reason we need a DevOps team for an application is simply the number of instances we need to care for. No development team could interact with all of the necessary machines in an efficient manner. Sure, we could register them all in Zookeeper, provide an SSH bot to do automated rollouts, and pup have Puppet enforce no changes happen. But that's all stuff Kube provides to us for free. Kubernetes abstracts those thousands of boxes and tens of thousands of instances of microservices. Again, however, simply being able to direct those thousands of instances 
isn't it enough to enable our developers to operate their own software? Remember, we're in like 50 data centers and actually quite literally hundreds of thousands of micro, uh, instances of microservices running. They also need to be able to introspect the running state of that system in near real time. Just like an operating system, I need not only PS, but top, IOSTAT, and journal could help. So in Kubernetes, PS and syscuttle functionality is effectively handled by kubectl. So what's IOSTAT? It's Grafana or Sysdig or C Advisor. There's tons of great stuff out there for this. What about journal cuddle? That's your Elk or Splunk stack. And I just keep saying cuddle on this slide. Um, so what about strace? That is something like open tracing for us or Zipkin. Um, but it's not enough that those tools exist. They need to just work. I don't need to modify my programs to use IOSTAT. It's part of the platform. It's well documented. And that's a key both to uptake and effectiveness in the organization. Common, easy to use tooling that's available to everyone. And just like Unix, I also need sophisticated permissions and process isolation. I can't operate independently of others on a shared platform if I could um, accidentally, let's go with accidentally, fork bomb the system. That means I need, you guessed it, resource limits. And Cube in the cloud native environment provides these. It provides us a data center operating system. Okay, so now we've given our developers a platform they can use to operate our system. But what about deploying new ones? What about meeting the ever-growing number of customers who use our software? Let's look into how to solve this. If Cube is the Linux of our data center, I need an RPM and YUM for deploying and managing installed software. If your infrastructure of a service is extremely simplistic, that's a really enormous task. And trust me, I've tried to do it. Um, if your infrastructure as a service has a complete, well-thought-out API like Cube, it's very doable. So our organization sat down to write these for ourselves. Uh, we needed a way to deploy concrete versions of a whole microservice system that could be tested, upgraded, and migrated online. So we call those two items Geronimo and Teclisham. Um, internal to Comcast, but uh, we're hoping to open source soon. Uh, we have Geronimo. It interacts with the Cube API to store the versions of deployed software, track across clusters what software is deployed, and abstract environmental specific configs. Geronimo, via the Cube API, provides automated deployment and rollback, hooking into arbitrary validators. Um, and those are defined in what we call our Geronimo file. They can monitor production, production metrics, run smoke tests, upgrade database, and well, anything, that's what arbitrary means. Uh, now that we have a way to package and deploy software in a repeatable manner, effectively in RPM, we can vastly simplify our QA and release process. So let's deep dive on that for a second. Uh, the Cube API lets us label deployed pods and software. So in those labels, the tool writes the version of the system we expect. You saw that in this screenshot here. Um, to verify that the things are what we expect them to be, uh, we store a cryptographic hash of all related JSON items like replication controllers, endpoints, et cetera, um, in the system annotations, which annotations are not mutable at runtime. Um, each system is kept in a Geronimo file, which is a wrapper around the cube format. It describes the environment independent format of the system. Remember I said we're in over 50 data centers and that has to do with pushing video very close to the edge. Um, an environment file is then combined uh, with, the, with the system file and it contains environment specific configs, things like replication counts, secrets for that environment, um, endpoints in that environment that are specific, et cetera. So when Geronimo goes to upgrade a system, it stands up a new namespace with the new version. It then slowly decrements pods from the old namespace and adds them in replication controllers to the new system. So this way we can roll whole developed uh, micro or nano service systems at once in a repeatable and testable fashion. 
But what if we want to install whole groups of software that are dependent on each other? Again, we need a yum. Leveraging the Kubernetes API, we are developing Teclisium to integrate these individual systems into testable services. It, like yum, resolves and installs all dependencies of a system based on version. Indeed, like yum's group install, it becomes possible to simply install a linear video lane that consists of quite literally hundreds of components. It will also warn you statically as you build the system if uh, dependencies are not satisfied. So Teclisium begins with a co component. Uh, that's a whole artifact like a Docker container. It layers on this the concept of a system, as in a Geronimo system, which is composed of those components. That might be something like the set of microservices we use for cloud DVR recordings. Each system is assumed to be a flat working namespace and a, has a methodology to deploy it, like Geronimo. Those systems are then linked together to form a service. A service is something like video on demand. Um, and video on demand is a really big thing. It's advertising systems, it's video backend systems, it's configuration systems, it's a lot of things. And those are managed by huge groups that are disparate from each other and usually often in separate namespaces with separate permissions. Um, so just like an RPM can provide and require certain files, we allow systems to provide and require configurations and linkages. Um, this lets us statically determine the wiring of a system. It's kind of like if Docker Compose was applied to Kubernetes namespaces, but we also allow it to link and compose arbitrary services, things like cameras for playback testing, um, physical hardware databases that we can't get into Cube yet, and those kinds of items. So notice, what I've described here also enforces common best practices for configuration and deployment throughout the organization. We no longer have 10 teams with their own puppet modules or even just their own handwritten configs. New users to our code base no longer need to learn all technologies from their peers or read wikis with those outdated architecture diagrams. The code base is becoming self-describing. If you want, you just grab the Teclisium file for linear and it will describe to you not only how everything is deployed, but how it's linked together for something like video on demand. So the amount of necessary communication in our organization drops dramatically. And as uh, all the developers here I'm sure would love, the amount of necessary documentation drops dramatically. The system is self-documenting. With this, I can also auto-deploy from source code changes, allowing QA to integrate with the exposed endpoints and write service level tests that describe the expected behavior of our system, not just of our individual components. And as I said, we have hundreds of those, which means I can safely deploy my components as I finish work on them to QA and just assign the card onwards for them to write integration tests for the end-to-end -end system which they'll see when all components involved in that new feature have finished their work. Our infrastructure team no longer has to work on the behest of each application team with Cube 2. They deploy bare metal provisioning that provides us with the capability to bootstrap clusters in a single go. Our Kubernetes self-deploy onto hardware as it's plugged in. As infrastructure is changed, rebooted, or otherwise, Cube's ability to automatically utilize or withstand failures, utilize the new equipment or withstand failures, lets these groups move quickly without necessarily notifying and working with the teams which run on their stacks. Think about if AWS, for those of you who use it, had to notify you every time they rebooted a node. Um, in this new world, for us, they're free to focus on owning and operating that infrastructure they develop, an independent DevOps team. For bare metal provisioning, um, I'm going to deep dive on that for a second. Um, boxes only need to have power and network cables plugged in. Um, they pixie boot, send up a hardware config, which returns a boot image and triggers workflow auto, um, automation to auto-join the clusters 
with the appropriate labels applied. Even better, these CoreOS images are not stored. They're in memory. Um, uh, that means they're immutable, which is important because it means our test environments match production. No point in testing something that doesn't match production. Um, and drift of the configuration of the underlying platform is much more difficult to have happen. Um, this process decouples our platform teams from our hardware deployment teams. Hardware deployment doesn't even have to notify them when it's done. Hardware just appears in our platform inventory as it's powered and cabled. And think of the power of that compared to, I plugged it in, please go install the OS and set up the network correctly and the DNS and all of that. No, we just come up. So to decouple our platform teams uh, from our software teams, we need platform updates to be low risk and repeatable and frequent. So how do you accomplish that? CICD. The same CICD platforms that deploy our software now deploy our platforms. First, deployment is done to test an environment, a to a test environment, um, that's running a production-like config and production-like applications. As that deployment runs, a sophisticated integration, integration test suite runs. It does things like verify Docker doesn't hang, uh, for those of you who've run into that. Networking works, no performance degradations have happened, logging still works, et cetera. So when that piece of continuous integration is done, we begin the continuous deployment part. Rolling upgrades begin in production. We again run that integration suite as we deploy production. Um, and we also have, can hook into production metrics and auto back out deploys that are failing or causing applications underneath us to die. So that makes our platform teams capable of deploying freely and often and with confidence. Um, they've also provided features like user-allocated high-performance load balancers for our platforms. Um, for details on that, you should go to my colleague Kim's talk tomorrow. Uh, in this new world, teams need far less communication about the new releases. The registry contains all that information. This makes what communication we do have far more efficient on group um, between the groups. It's much more focused on the technical operation or the technical details rather than the operations of their components. Everything I have described here is about decoupling the operations of these teams at an organizational level and giving those teams a platform to manage their own large, complicated distributed systems as easily as I can administer my local Linux box. Having also encoded the information about the current running state of the system in the system it becomes self-discoverable and self-describing. So these are the tenets that drive our ability to scale teams. Discovery and dissemination of actionable knowledge, the ability to create impactful change, and the safety and the freedom and the comfort to do so. We want to empower people, provide them with in independence of action and unity of direction. To do that for an organization operating a large distributed system, we must have a complete platform, a platform that is easy to use and transparent in its operation, a platform that automates as much work as possible from the users, but lets them configure it as necessary, from process management to metrics to deployment and upgrades. If your teams also focus on decoupling from others, acting as complete platforms themselves from other teams, which was mentioned uh, today in the keynotes, um, as our infrastructure team has, they can dramatically increase their effectiveness. They no longer need to continually work and do that poll with everybody else around them. And this is why Cube is such an effective tool for scaling an organization, because it allows teams to to operate independent of each other, it allows us to provide simple declarative definitions of a system, and its sophisticated yet simple APIs make building tooling to meet your own needs very simple. And that's, that's very key. The Cube APIs are a huge part of building a successful organization, just as the Linux kernel APIs are a huge part of building a successful Linux application. All right, thank you for your time and any questions?
more than 50 acres that are behind five that don't really be classic. Uh, are you guys using uh, some kind of federation or hard to organize which, uh, which data center is used by which team or are you using federation? So most of the data centers are actually used by all teams. Um, Comcast, as I mentioned, we have a lot of users um, and we also own the network. So it's in our own best interest to push that video traffic as close to the users as we can. Um, so most of those data centers, like actually all teams deploy to all data centers. Um, so we don't, now there are what we call national data centers um, and we don't have Obviously, the Cube 1.6 CABIC stuff um, deployed yet. That's a, that's a major push underway. We also have, as I mentioned, done deployment of tens of thousands of Puppet VMs, and that's run by our operations team, and we're slowly making the change to try to move as much as that possible into Cube so those operators can focus on operating the system more like a whole system and less as a set of little services. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, when you spoke of platform inventory, uh, what, what inventory tool do you use? Um, so we don't, that, we don't use an inventory tool uh, today for platform inventory. Teclisham acts like a yum server in that it, it tells you um, what, what components are available to be deployed. As far as uh, it also, and this is where it's not like yum, it actually is probably the piece that manages platform inventory the most, though those are usually individual components. Unfortunately, most of our platform, most of the platform inventory stuff out there wouldn't work with what we do. Like I mentioned, we have physical cameras that do playback testing. We have transcoder hardware that's very unique and, and actually hardware. So we can't just say, oh, this is you know, a, a SQL database or something like that. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about monitoring and debugging in your system and how that's changed as you monitor? Yeah, so we, we always had like Splunk or at Splunk. Um, the, the big change is we use Sysdig um, internally a bunch. Uh, the big change is instead of going in, setting up a VM, which in a lot of our instances, like we're running packaging on a single channel. Even a single core VM is way too thick for that. So we would deploy tons of applications there and then trying to slice that out becomes very, very difficult. Whereas when you change to a kind of cloud native environment where you can really focus on a specific pod doing a single operation and a single task, um, setting up that monitoring and alarming as they were talking about today in the Prometheus uh, keynote becomes much simpler. Um, the other part with logging on the other side of this though is it's worth noting that you end up generating so much logs in these systems, particularly from, uh, particularly from microservices that trace each other. Um, most people at that scale run some sort of sampling rather than, uh, rather than logging every operation because eventually the system generates more metrics than anything else, and that's all you spend your time doing. Um, and I've talked to folks at other very large companies who all say the same thing. It's, it's mostly just statistical sampling at some point, even, even with things like Prometheus behind you. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, not everything can be put into containers. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think about it? This is the first question. And the second question, are you using OpenStack in your infrastructure or something for w what virtualization platform? Um, okay, so first question, not everything can be put in containers and that's absolutely true. We have tons of products that don't fit in containers. Um, I mentioned transcoders and we have tens of thousands of those. Um, they don't generally fit well in uh, containers because they run on ASICs. Um, the, the, way, the way you deal with that is try your best to make it look like containers, which is what you do with Puppet and VMs at scale anyways. The Puppet enforces that it's a container, it can't be changed, and you have VM images that come up and come down and auto-scale and deploy. There's not much you can do beyond that than 
then try to make it look like containers. Um, for the stuff that can't be put in containers, the other thing we, we face, um, as I mentioned to Klisham, you can't put an iPad in a container. I need to physically watch the iPad, and I can't like scrape the screen of what should be playing because that would break our DRM, and I need to make DR sure DRM is working. So that, that kind of stuff, you write managers on top of, again, your own little ones, and try as best as you can to integrate it with your infrastructure. Your second question was, sorry, OpenStack. Open um, so Comcast has three separate virtualization platforms internally, um, and it depends on the application. For the video stuff, which is what Viper does, uh, we try to spend as much of that on bare metal because that is all I.O. bound, and virtualization platforms not always the best at I.O. bound tasks. Like the reason our initial deployment was tens of uh, boxes is because egress, even in the smallest site, was more than 10 gigabits a second, so more than a single NIC would normally run. In, in really large sites, it's hundreds of gigabits per second. So running that off of virtualization platforms has a huge overhead, um, which is why we have so many bare metal provisioning. And as I mentioned, Kim's talk actually goes in a bit into depth on, on what we do for load balancing and stuff for that. Um, we do have OpenStack, and we do have uh, vSphere for virtualization of more kind of normal applications. Um, and those are run by our cloud. We have an internal cloud team as well. We are very polyglot. Um, I think we have at least six or seven deployed languages. Um, and we don't actually, we're not like a lot of big organizations, we don't declare official languages. So people use whatever. We have Scala, we have Java, we have Go, we have lots of Go. We have C, we have C++, we have, it's, it's whatever those teams want to use. Um, one of our big focuses, and this is part of my job, developer efficiency and effectiveness, is trying to make sure our developers are as happy as they can be. And a lot of that's about giving them the initiative and the right to choose the right tool for the for the job, and that really depends, and it's like, I can't dictate that down to them. Um, which is part of the reason containers are great, because we don't, I, I don't have to. As long as the container runs, I don't care. Any other questions? Sounds like we're done. If you guys have any questions you want, feel free to approach me afterwards. Thanks for your time. <laughs>